hopefully that clears up the fear that you would respond incorrectly or inappropriately, give you more confidence in what the rules and regulations actually are, and then promote and push for a world where people with disabilities belong, they're accepted, and they're given the same rights and opportunities as non-disabled humans. Welcome to Chez Jeunesse, the place of new beginnings. My name is Katherine Hubert, and I founded and own a French-inspired cafe where, as a team, we are on a mission to change the way that our world understands neurodiversity and employs humans with disabilities. Our restaurant was born and is based in Greensboro, North Carolina, and that's where we practice and teach our mission and model. This is our channel where we dive in deep to who we are, what we do, and why we do it. Our hope is that this content is empowering to disabled and non-disabled humans alike, and that no matter what perspective you are coming from, employer, employee, parent, friend, or Shazeness fan, you feel welcomed, you learn something new, and you walk away with a deeper appreciation and understanding of humanity. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. How are you today? I'm a little tired. <laughs> I'm a little bit scattered. So this is take two. I'm attempting the second round at filming. Hopefully it will be a little bit smoother and a little bit less jumbled and a little higher energy. My energy was definitely low the last time, so I'm gonna try to knock it up for you a little bit this time. Knock it up, maybe that's not the right phrase. Dial it up, I'm gonna dial it up for you a little bit on this time, but welcome. I'm so excited to have you here. I'm talking today about Matthew and Paul, who are two of my favorite content creators on the internet right now. I got introduced to them earlier this year the algorithm, thank you algorithm, put them into my search field and I have been watching their content since and I'm so thankful for it. If you're not already familiar with them, Matthew and Paul consider themselves to be an interabled couple. Matthew is non-disabled and Paul is blind and they have a guide dog named Mr. Maple. A lot of the content that they create is centered around disability awareness and specifically around blindness their experience as a couple, Paul's experience himself as a blind person, their experience with Mr. Maple. They present all of their content in a very personable, charming, oftentimes lighthearted and humorous way, but that provides so much insight and education and really is just very inviting into their lives and their stories, which I have enjoyed greatly. So hit them up, follow them. It's amazing. They're amazing. But there's been a lot of talk over the past few weeks about an incident that happened with Paul recently where he was denied service at an establishment because he had his service dog in attendance with him, which is legal. It's protected under the Americans with Disability Act, so he was unfairly, inappropriately discriminated against and denied service and harassed, I would say, from the way that it was handled. I'm gonna let you watch that clip here so that I don't play it back word for word and that you get to actually hear it and see it in Paul's voice and from his perspective. And then we're gonna talk about it. I'm blind and I just got kicked out of a restaurant in Seattle. I walked in with my guide dog, Mr. Maple, and immediately somebody rushed up to me and said, no pets allowed, only service dogs. I said, it's okay, he's a service dog. He looked at me, he looked at Maple, he said, emotional support dog. No, like a guide dog for the blind. I literally had this harness attached to him. I showed this to him. I said, I'm blind. He said, you don't look blind. And I said, a lot of people in the blind community still have some functional vision. He said, you're looking right at me. I said, yes, but it's like, I have a pinhole of vision. It's all I can see. He said, listen, this isn't my first rodeo. He literally said that. He said, this isn't my first rodeo. What is going on out there that would lead this man to believe that I was lying? And he said, do you see any other dogs in this restaurant? I said, well, I honestly, no, I'm, I'm blind. I, I, th th there could be. I, I said, I could come back with his paperwork. And he said, if you step foot back in this restaurant with that dog, I will call the police. I, I'm speechless. Okay, so this has gone viral. There have been a lot of news channels, media that have picked it up. People have been sharing it around Instagram. I don't have more value to add to the story and experience because it's not my story and it's not my experience. So that's not what I'm here to do today. What I am here to do is to break down the Americans with Disability Act and the, not the whole thing. We don't have time to do the whole thing <laughs> here today on this channel, but 
to talk specifically about the guidelines around service animals because there's a good chance that most of you watching this channel work in a public environment. And if so, this is something that you maybe have already encountered or that you will at some point. It doesn't mean that you have to be the leader or the manager at your place of work, but having this information is going to be an asset to your team and also to people with disabilities who may be experiencing or coming into your place of work. I'm gonna give a breakdown of what qualifies as a service animal, how does that play out, and then what is protected under the ADA. We're gonna talk about all of those things here Hopefully that clears up the fear that you would respond incorrectly or inappropriately, give you more confidence in what the rules and regulations actually are, and then promote and push for a world where people with disabilities belong, they're accepted, and they're given the same rights and opportunities as non-disabled humans. So let's jump in. Shayjana, teammates, your keyword this week is spaghetti. The specific wording under the ADA is service animals are defined as dogs that are individually trained to do work or perform tasks for people with disabilities and a service animal must be under the control of its handler. Service animals can be used to accompany people with disabilities in a variety of different ways. So that could be someone who is blind, someone who's deaf, someone who's in a wheelchair, someone who experiences seizures, someone with PTSD, someone who is taking medication for specific mental illness. That was point number one, that service animals are for an individual with a disability. That can be many different disabilities, but they do need to be accompanied by their handler when they are in public. The second piece that someone with a disability is permitted entrance and accompaniment by their service animal, <laughs> their service animal in all general public spaces or all spaces where the general public is allowed to go. So what does that mean? Where would there be a differentiation? The example that the ADA gave, which I think is a really clear cut one, is like in a hospital setting, a patient's room, a cafeteria, a waiting room. Those would all be areas where the general public could be admitted. So a service animal would be able to accompany their person in all of those scenarios, the operating room, a storage closet, something like that, where it would be a staff only, it's not the general public, then a service animal would not be permitted in those spaces. So general public areas only, but if the general public has access to an area, then a person with a disability with a service animal also needs to be granted access in those areas. That's kind of the breakdown of what a service animal is, where service animals are permitted. Keep in mind, service dogs are specially trained. They have certifications, they have paperwork. They're usually very expensive. There's a classification and a training and qualifications that service animals go through that pets and emotional support animals do not. So there is a difference. If you're in a space where someone is coming in with a dog and you are not sure if that dog is a service animal, there are two questions that you can ask and only two. So this is the part to pay attention to and this is where the person who is talking to Paul really effed it up, okay? So your two questions are, Number one, is the dog a service animal required because of a disability? And question number two, what work or task has the dog been trained to perform? Those are your two questions. I'm gonna say them again because these are important. Number one, is the dog a service animal required because of a disability? And number two, what work or task has the dog been trained to perform? Those are the two questions that you can ask. Questions that you cannot ask are about the person's disability. What disability do you have? Other clarifying questions. You cannot request or require medical documentation for that disability. If someone says, I have epilepsy and this dog, well, they don't even have to disclose that. They could just say this dog has been performed to assist with seizures. Say that's what they said. Then you could be like, well, do you have epilepsy? Do you have paperwork from your doctor stating that you have epilepsy? Like, no, you cannot do that. You cannot ask those questions. 
You cannot request a special identification card or training documentation for the dog. So you do not request medical documentation for the person with the disability. You do not require credentials or paperwork for the dog. And you do not ask for the dog to perform the tasks that they are trained in in order to prove that they are a service animal. You might be watching this being like, that's ridiculous, why would anybody do that? That's what happened to Paul, okay? So this is still happening. There's a reason why this law exists, right? And there's a wa reason why it's so specific because these are the kinds of things that people do and ask. So, is the dog a service animal and required because of a disability? What work or task has the dog been trained to perform? Do not ask that dog to perform. Do not ask the person with a disability what their disability is, if they can prove it or not. And they don't have to prove that their dog is a service dog. So you're going off of their word. And that should be enough. That is enough, okay? You take somebody at their word. It doesn't matter if you think they're telling the truth or not, you take them at their word. They are protected under the American with Disabilities Act, and you move on. I feel like I switched into mom mode a little bit for, the, <laughs> for that last part. I don't know if that was coaching or if that was mothering. This is not the way you do it, okay? That's just because, because, because I said so. There are some other nuances to all of that. We're not gonna get into all of it today. Again, you can reference the ADA if you would like for more information, but those are the big things to break down what qualifies as a service animal. A dog, that dog is specifically trained and will have documentation, but you do not get to request that if someone says that they have a service animal. The service animal must be accompanied by their handler and the person with the disability and the service dog are granted access into any space that the general public has access to. That trumps other rules. So like a restaurant, typically animals aren't permitted in a restaurant because of health code reasons. The ADA trumps the health code. Someone with the service animal may come and sit in the restaurant even if that would typically not be permitted by health code because the general public is permitted to come into this space so the person with the disability and their service animal is also permitted. They're given equal access and opportunity. I think that's it for today. If you have questions or comments or thoughts about any of that, please drop it below. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being part of this small community. That's something that I've been reflecting on quite a bit in the past couple of weeks and just recognizing that it's a really brave and a big thing to be a follower of something that doesn't have a lot of followers and to see value and merit in something before other people do is also can be hard to lead something that doesn't have a lot of followers. And so for me to have you here in this community feels really special and feels almost like this incubation period where we get to experience this together and in a smaller and a more personal way. And I'm just really grateful for that. So thanks for being here. Thanks for being part of this work. Thanks for wanting to grow and learn and to push our world to be more accepting and to be more open and understanding and to also take responsibility to understand and educate ourselves. I appreciate you. Follow Matthew and Paul. Follow us. I'll see you next week.